used to ride horses, or el bracero que si te quiso la de veras. Nothing disturbs them now, doomed to be idle, to haul no cart or wagon, wear no bridle. Soul is the issue of so strict a fate. Serene now, superhuman, they crop their field. From the Horses by Jorge Guillén, translated by Richard Wilbur. On the day they took him to the hospital, Grandpa Pedro fell hard, as if a shooting star had struck the orange tree under which he secretly smoked bud to relieve the pain from the time he slipped in our shower. Mom and I knew he would die soon. Both told ourselves never to one another. He probably won't. When I got to the waiting room, my Aunt Chabela, Grandpa's oldest daughter, was standing there, white, bald face, looking away from the family. You know, she finally said, he used to ride his horse when he was young, fast, very fast, down a hill. It was so loud that it sounded like a rainstorm hitting the dirt. All his kids used to come out to see him, but I was too afraid to look. In the glassy sheen of her eyes, I could see his. They didn't merely share the same gaze. She had her father's eyes. Her stifled whimpers were like grandpa's when he used to yelp, ay ay ay, as in the refrain of a corrido any time he sat down or got up. I was ashamed to admit that the memory of his pain still made me laugh. So I pictured instead the flash of life in him from a week before when we walked to the corner store to buy his favorite bread, Entenmann's Coconut Crunch Donuts. Their fozzy bear complexion served as his nightcap, accompanied by a tall glass of milk filled to the brim. He'd eat them in pairs, frugal even in pleasure. At the store, we walked straight to the baked goods aisle, where he stacked four rectangular boxes in a shopping cart as neatly as hay bales, and then back to the checkout line. As the cashier scanned the items, Grandpa pulled out money from a blue paisley bandana as he did back in Mexico when he bought a young horse that no one had ever ridden. The bills were crumpled and worn like his Levi's, spangled with bird catcher spots of paint and bleach. He handed her the tender as gently as if it would crumble in her hands like a delicate pastry. The woman at the register stared at one of the bills and then at Grandpa and back at the bill as if she were trying to find a resemblance between his wrinkles and receded hairline and Washington's. I placed his bread in two plastic bags as he adjusted his sombrero and outstretched his hands towards me. I knew that all he wanted was to embrace the weight of something that made him feel useful, to burden his body with work again. I licked my finger and peeled away two plastic bags and shook them until they inflated like rumbling thunder. I placed a box of entomans in each and handed him the translucent sacks. As we walked home, his arms swung listlessly like two freshly braided ropes, long, thin, but strong enough to tame a wild horse. Sweat dripped down the waddles of his neck from the sweatband of his yellow Stetson, yellowing deeper with every drop. As we neared the house, I remember mom once telling me that grandpa always smelled of sweat and dirt and work. She used to look forward to resting her head on his shoulder and run her fingertips on the tanned wrinkles cross-hatched on the nape of his neck. Though work withered and rough, his hands were gentle on her cheek, like a fire that burns the firewood but warms the hearth. Death's thrumming hooves bathed my back like a gentle rain when I saw Grandpa lying unconscious in his room that night. Though he wasn't going to break this stallion, I couldn't look away. And for an instant, I swear, I could see him galloping bareback on Lucero, a horse as indomitable as him, drunk on aguardiente, his little girl in one arm, and Colt Mane in his other hand.